I'm Professor Carr Everbach, and uh, thank you for coming to the second panel. When I was asked to moderate an inauguration panel called Sustainable Living, I immediately began receiving questions asking if that meant campus carbon neutrality, personal li living habits of students, faculty, and staff, political action regarding energy and climate legislation, or whether Swarthmore would be building another straw bale house on campus. Today we've assembled a trio of distinguished Swarthmore alumni who will address various aspects of sustainable living in the context of the leadership role that the college should play in an increasingly divided, clamorous, and dysfunctional world. Chris Laszlo, class of 1980, is co-founder and managing partner of Sustainable Value Partners, a management consulting firm helping companies create business value through integrating sustainability and corporate social responsibility. Anne Kapuscinski, class of 76, is the first professor of sustainability science at Dartmouth College, having previously served as a professor of fisheries and conservation biology at the University of Minnesota, and the founding director of Minnesota's Institute for Social, Economic, and Ecological Sustainability. And Matt St. Clair, class of 97, is the first sustainability manager for the University of California's Office of the President, leading sustainability efforts across all the UC campuses. Prior to that appointment, Matt worked on international sustainability campaigns and on renewable energy research at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Swarthmore College, of course, was founded in an agrarian and mercantile society, just as the Industrial Revolution was, so to speak, picking up steam. Its continuing commitment to Quaker values of simplicity, conservation of resources, and excellence in education, as well as prudent money management, has sustained it through its almost 150 years of existence. But Swarthmore is also saturated in the industrial, and now possibly post-industrial, culture of the United States, in which energy was relatively cheap, and competition for the best students led us to think that every new building had to look inside like a Starbucks. Rebecca Chopp, recognizing the growing concerns at Swarthmore and worldwide concerning resource overuse, global climate change, and the consequences of dependence on fossil fuels, has chosen sustainability as a sub-theme of her inauguration. This week, on the recommendation of the College Sustainability Committee, which I co-chair, President Chopp signed the President's Climate Commitment, a statement of intent for the institution and its community to move toward carbon neutrality and greater educational leadership on the environment. I'll now turn to Chris Laszlo. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll now turn to Chris Laszlo for his comments, followed by that of the other panelists. If audience members have an important question or comment, please raise your hand if you don't have a card, and a staff member will hand you one. You may write your comments on the card and then hold the card up again. That staff member will take the card up to me, and I'll uh, pose the question if we have time for the panel's response. Chris? Thanks, Carr. I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here. The question before us is what role should Swarthmore play in helping to create a more sustainable world? And what I would like to focus on is its role in shaping leaders who can contribute solutions to global challenges. Uh, global challenges such as energy and food security, water, global poverty, and social justice. Just this last week, some of you might have seen in the New York Times editorial, there was a piece about the link between chemicals in the environment and rising cancer rates, uh, based on a study that had come out earlier in the week from the US, uh, the president's uh, panel, cancer panel. Toxic chemicals in air, water, and food are just one of many uh, urgent pressing issues uh, that we uh, need to address now. Presumably a reason for choosing the theme of sustainability in this inauguration symposium is that critical thinking and scholarship 
now have to be in service of action. Specifically, action that helps support a healthy and sustainable world. If scholarship is not linked to action, we might not have a world to study and theorize. Now, there are many paths to leadership, and I would like to take a few minutes to highlight one in particular, and that is uh, the path that students can take to go into the business world. The question is, why should Swarthmore send its best and brightest, those that are most committed to making a difference, into the business world? I would like to suggest that there are two good reasons. The first is that no other institution has the power, the global reach, and the nimbleness to tackle complex global problems. And the second reason is that new market forces, including declining resources, but also radical transparency and rising expectations, are pushing, excuse me, are pushing sustainability into business, not for moral reasons, even though those are clearly important too, but simply because it's smart business. Social responsibility and going green are ways that companies can cut costs, differentiate products, get into new markets, enhance their reputation, and in some cases change the rules of the game with uh, new legislation that instead of slowing down environmental health and social regulations is actually, uh, companies are lobbying to increase the standards that they can meet and perhaps some of their overseas competitors are not able to. So companies are embedding sustainability today because the market requires it of them. Customers and investors and employees want to know how a product is sourced and manufactured and whether it can be consumed and disposed of responsibly. Producing such future business leaders will clearly require a interdisciplinary uh, education and a breadth of knowledge that is not typical of today's business leaders. For example, I understand that my uh, colleague here is a biology major from Swarthmore, right? And I was just reflecting on that, uh, the fact that biology will be useful in many non-biology fields, for example, in the energy sector um, as those pursuing new renewable energy projects try to decrypt photosynthesis well enough to understand how sunlight can be converted to usable energy at the kind of 95% efficiency rates that plants and certain microbes are able to do. Now clearly Swarthmore is very well positioned to create this kind of deep interdisciplinary uh, leader for tomorrow. The question is, can it build on its Quaker heritage to do so and to produce leaders such as, for example, Iqbar Qadir, class of 1981, who went on to found the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, which is now a model of doing business in emerging markets. I just want to finish by saying when I was at Swarthmore in the late 1970s, uh, there was a distinctly anti-business bias. Uh, it's as if those who uh, went on to business schools were, had somehow not quite made it with those that were going on into more scholarly pursuits. Uh, I think there's an opportunity now to restore business to its role of leadership in society, to knit together the whole fabric of civilization in the, word, in the words of Thomas J. Watson Sr., the founder of IBM, he spoke those words almost exactly 100 years ago. So can we make business an appealing path for Swarthmore graduates uh, after Swarthmore to go into, these, uh, into business? Uh, and in finishing, will Swarthmore produce those business leaders of tomorrow? Thank you.
Thank you. I am also really thrilled uh, and deeply honored uh, to be participating in this panel and therefore have the uh, opportunity to be involved in this entire inauguration uh, ceremony for our new president, Rebecca Chop. It's, it's really actually humbling to, to be part of this. Uh, I think the main reason I was invited to speak on this panel is that I have been involved now at two different academic institutions in leading the development of new curricula for sustainability. Uh, the first place I did it was in University of Minnesota where I uh, spent 25 years of my career. And uh, over about a four-year process, I led an extremely interdisciplinary group of faculty um, in developing um, a new self-freestanding sustainability studies minor, which became extremely successful. It's actually now in its fourth year. Uh, one of my goals in, in uh, launching that was hoping that we would get students who were majoring in the humanities, in business, in natural sciences, social sciences involved, and we did accomplish that. In the first uh, graduating class, we had students from over 20 majors. And for example, in uh, one of the courses we designed um, that was an exit course, a problem-solving course called Sustainable Communities, which I co-taught, I as a biologist co-taught with an architect. Uh, one, of the major, one of the students in that course um, was a Spanish major, and she wrote in her reflection essay that she had been afraid of taking um, ecology courses and other kinds of science courses because she didn't think she really had the scientific foundation to study that, but she was deeply concerned about sustainability problems and that she felt through this minor that had been demystified for her and she had actually come to see that some of the thinking skills she had developed as a Spanish major were actually applicable to the problem solving. So for me that was uh, extremely rewarding. Uh, I'm now at Dartmouth College. I moved there um, this past fall and uh, have been very busy since uh, early October um, trying to lead a similar process to develop um, a sustainability curriculum at Dartmouth. And the college wasn't sure exactly what form that should take. Uh, we ended up uh, concluding through, again, a very intensive collaborative process with workshops, open houses, uh, I would say th a deliberative civil discourse kind of process like the past panel talked about in which we worked very hard, for example, to understand the different mental models that our faculty from different disciplines were bringing to the table. These are basically different epistemologies that influenced whether how we think about, for example, is the environment part of our socioeconomic system or is a socioeconomic system within the larger environment. These really fundamentally different mental models that people don't always talk about openly, and therefore it makes it very hard to do something like collaboratively develop um, a sustainability curriculum. So I'm happy to say that after a, a lot of really hard work, some very serious commitment to deep listening, to understand different perspectives, we're very close to getting um, a new sustainability track accepted. It'll be a track within the existing environmental studies minor at Dartmouth College. We just had a unanimous vote um, of one faculty committee this past Monday, and we have one more committee um, vote to get through, which will be on May 25th, and I'm optimistic that it will be approved. So the question that really I often get asked is, well, why are sustainability curricula starting to pop up all over the place, and how does sustainability education differ from environmental studies? I don't think that's quite the right question. It's not so much that it differs. It's more that um, it's a, a, an appropriate um, response from the education world to uh, really one of the greatest challenges of our time. And it's an attempt to sharpen the focus of what environmental studies programs I think have always wanted to do. Some environmental studies programs were started as early as the 1970s. I believe that the one at Dartmouth was one of the first in the nation. Swarthmore's was started in 1992. If you look at the, the goals and the mission statements of these environmental studies programs, they all pretty much share the idea that we want our students to better understand how humans interact with the environment and how the environment turns around and shapes Human, human actions and to understand the complexity of environmental problems and get better at, at learning what are the tools to solve those problems. But I think that there are two interconnected reasons why there's this growth now of sustainability curricula. The first one Chris sort of touched on is that we are now seeing unsustainability trends everywhere. 
Um, they started with the Industrial Revolution, but they have really accelerated in the last three decades. Um, recently, they've been called the Great Collision Between Society and the Planet. In a book written by Gus Speth, a recently retired uh, dean of the School of, the, of uh, Forestry and Environment at Yale University, we see uh, inability to meet the Millennium Development Goals. We're seeing um, rising disparities between the wealthy and the poor. We're seeing um, uh, difficulty in uh, having adequate fresh water. We're seeing collapsing fisheries, which is one of the things that um, I'm interested in. And even when we're looking at ways to replace things like collapsing fisheries, we're seeing the development of aquaculture, the world's fastest growing food sector, following, unfortunately, many of the mistakes that were, that were committed in industrial agriculture. So there's this sense, a collective awareness, really, that we've reached a tipping point, and a sense that the ways of thinking that led to the positive benefits of the Industrial Revolution are also at the root of this exploding set of unsustainability problems. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from Einstein, which I think is appropriate here. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So that means we need different ways of thinking and acting, and that is clearly an um, important role for education, to train our, our new leaders to have different ways of thinking and acting. Let me give you an example from the area of climate change. There's this very interesting emerging field of resilience thinking or resilience analysis that was started by ecologists but has, has expanded and is now involving social scientists. And just a few weeks ago, I was actually meeting with um, a professor in the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College because I discovered that he has begun, he and some of his colleagues have begun to use resilience thinking as a new way of analyzing, they think a very powerful way of analyzing the business cycle and understanding actually why we run into the kinds of problems like we've just had with our economy here in the United States and how we can avoid them in the future. Well, if you apply resilience thinking to climate change, what it tells you is that our society, we have, we have essentially organized ourselves in a society that doesn't pay attention to slow changing variables that change over across generations of, human, of, of people and often are actually the thing that controls whether our socio-ecological system will be in one regime that might be more desirable or in an alternative regime. And the regimes can shift sometimes quite dramatically when a controlling variable reaches a threshold. In the case of climate change, that controlling variable is the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and it's clearly reaching a threshold now. So these are some of the kinds of ways of thinking that we need to bring front and center um, into our education programs. I think there's a second reason why there's um, this demand for sustainability curricula. It's really motivated by the question that students increasingly are asking, but I'm also seeing now more and more faculty asking these questions. How do we equip our students to lead and guide a major transition to sustainability of our entire civilization from local to global scales, and how do we do that in ways that are socially just, that are economically viable, that increase resilience more so than increasing optimization, and that increase our adaptability to uncertain futures, because I think we're finally beginning to realize as a civilization that we cannot control, completely control the future. We can do a lot of creative things, for example, through business to try to build a better future, but we can't completely control the future. Now, I am especially you know, I'm sort of a child of the 60s, right? I graduated in the class of 1976. I find an amazing bonding that I'm having with the students who are in college right now. I understand why they're clamoring um, for these kinds of education programs. And they're especially asking, please give us the chance in college to learn how to turn the knowledge, the theory, into action. And they often meet resistance from the faculty. This is not an, an issue only at the hallowed liberal arts uh, school that Swarthmore is, but I think that we, the elders, should listen to the youth this time. Their instincts are right. And I would argue that it's actually in fitting with the Quaker heritage of this college, very nicely uh, um, articulated by President Chop when she wrote recently about uh, guiding social transformation. Social transformation is about turning knowledge into action. And clearly, this generation and the generations coming after them sense um, tremendous crisis with climate change. That's not the only reason, but that's one of the overarching reasons. So the time has come for us to figure out how to do this um, in education programs. And I think it's completely in fitting um, 
with uh, Swarthmore, and I would love to see Swarthmore taking um, a major lead in this area. Let me end by just saying a little bit about what I've learned or maybe some of the key elements um, of an effective sustainability curriculum. Uh, maybe before I list those four elements, let me say first of all, there is no single right way to situate a sustainability curriculum in a um, higher education institution. Probably the most important lesson I've learned this last year is how, although I think we've ended up with fairly similar common elements, we're act ending up designing the placement of the sustainability curriculum at Dartmouth in a very different way than we did at the University of Minnesota. And that's fine. You really do have to pay attention to the history of each institution, what its strengths and weaknesses are, um, what its contingencies are, what its capacities are. That's exactly the kind of critical thinking, deep conversation that's appropriate to have and that I think we excel at doing at Swarthmore. So let me end with my four um, um, sort of key elements of a sustainability curriculum. First, you need to start with guiding students at the ability to take on a wickedly complex problem and then apply systemic and interdisciplinary methodologies to addressing that problem. Next, that requires that they learn and there are systematic method methodologies for doing this, they learn how to uncover different mental models held by those who have contributed to the problem and should also become part of the solution. What are the limits of these different mental models? What are their strengths? How do we accommodate different worldviews? Uh, when we have been writing about this as a learning outcome for minors both at Minnesota and now at Dartmouth, we referred to it as epistemic cognition. So I found it really interesting that the prior panel was talking about epistemic closing down. This is really the flip side of the coin that I'm talking about here. Secondly, uh, we need to equip our students so that they can really excel at identifying the key levers in a really complex situation. An example would be the slow variables I talked about from the resilience thinking ideas. Those key levers that can then become the focus for transformation to a sustainability path. And I'm really excited that Chris is on this panel because I think he's right and he knows much more about it than I do, but from what I can tell, there are amazing creative things happening in the business world which I think are getting um, at those key levers. But we need to become much more self-aware and kind of openly, I mean, uh, seriously committed to actually identifying those key levers. Third, we need our students to excel at forming, facilitating, and working in teams that can address real-world challenges. They need to know how to bring together people's different way of knowing from different academic disciplines, but also from different lived experience. So that means actually learning how to work um, at the boundary between practitioners, ordinary citizens, and scholars. Uh, next one, I've got two more left, is being, knowing then how to bring in the disciplinary knowledge and methods that come from our existing disciplines, which are all you know, fantastic here at Swarthmore. Bring those in in targeted ways to help work on those levers. And once you've got a good understanding of the different mental models that have been driving this complex problem. And then finally, the point that I stressed earlier, which is to turn knowledge into action. And ideally, that should actually be built into the curriculum. Um, we did some of that in the Sustainable Communities course um, at University of Minnesota. Uh, we have the same idea built into the curriculum at Dartmouth. I will be next year developing a new course called Sustainability Action Research, where the goal will be to actually work with a partner outside of Dartmouth College. I know that Swarthmore has done bits of this in the past, um, so I don't think this should be um, such a big stretch for Swarthmore either. Thank you. Well, I can't tell you what a thrill and an honor it is to be here on planet Swarthmore um, <laughs> and offer the opportunity to contribute to the collective discernment as Rebecca Chop used some Quaker terminology to describe part of what this event is meant to be. Um, I say planet Swarthmore. Last night we heard from a um, wonderful poet who is a soccer teammate of mine at Swarthmore who said that coming here was like coming to Mars. And I agree with him that Swarthmore is definitely to me felt like a different planet, but looking back on it now, rather than Mars, um, feels to me like it's a, a utopian, in the best sense of the word, community, a deliberative utopian community. And as an example of, of what this results in, one of my fellow economics majors, as we were graduating, he landed this wonderful 
um, pinnacle of American success, high paying job on Wall Street. And as soon as he told us about that, he said, oh, I'm only going to do it for a few years, then I'm going to save the world. <laughs> um, so setting aside the part of that, that that you'll talk about or have already talked about, the, the wall, why we can't go to Wall Street and change the world there, I'm going to focus on why did he feel responsibility to make the world a better place? What about Swarthmore gave him that innate sense of responsibility? Well, I think this leads in from what Anne was talking about in terms of the curriculum, then also being uh, complemented with leading by example and how successful Swarthmore is at modeling an equitable, inclusive, and empowered community. And I'm going to mention a few examples of what could be a long list um, of how Swarthmore embodies and signals these values to students and all members of its community. One is the Lang Scholars. Swarthmore doesn't give athletic scholarships, doesn't give merit scholarship, merit-based scholarships with the exception of a few McCabe scholarships for local students. But the Lang scholars, it seemed to me as a student here, these were the people who were held up. This is the, the best manifestation of what Swarthmore is about. These students who demonstrated leadership in community and volunteer service, they were the ones held up as being the top students at Swarthmore and were given funding and empowerment to do more of that as students. A second is honorary degrees. Swarthmore doesn't give honorary degrees to the most famous person they can bring to campus. It gives honorary degrees to distinguished alumni and other non-alumni that embody Swarthmore's values. Again, signaling what is important to the college. A third, and people don't realize how unique this is to Swarthmore and other, some other liberal arts colleges, all events here are free. All performances are free, all parties are free, and non-exclusive. That sends an important signal. And then fourth, things like pre the president's speeches or all language or spotlights in the college's communications, um, all the language that's used in that also send important sig signals. The fact that a sub-theme today is sustainability sends us an important signal. What are some of the manifestations that result from that? Well, there's the, the Lang Center for Social Change and all of its projects. A couple examples of, of recent student leadership around social justice. The, the Genocide Prevention Network, I don't know if I got the name right, and War News Radio, just a couple exemplary examples um, to be redundant. Um, but what can Swarthmore do beyond the admiral steps it is already taking to send signals along these lines that it values environmental awareness, environmental action, and environmental justice, and models sustainable living? Would that mean having laying sustainability scholars? Would it mean carbon neutral, zero waste commencement? Um, the third example, what about all, all events that are already free? What about if they, as a matter of course, and examine their environmental footprint, don't have disposables, um, are zero waste and carbon neutral? Or the fourth, what about sustainability being more than just a special topic, but constantly expressed as a core value, as a lens used as one consideration in all decisions and actions by the college? So I'll say a couple things about my my path and how important leading, leading by example has become internalized for me, in part because of what Swarthmore taught me. After Swarthmore, I went to the Czech Republic for two years, worked for a radical environmental activist group in the Czech Republic, and I learned so much about civil society and maintaining hope against all odds, to, to reiterate something else that was said, some other wisdom from last night. Um, what it took during communism and post-communism to maintain hope in, in the possibility of change um, against all odds. I, after spending two years there, working with this most influential environmental group in the country where when I arrived they had 25 employees, the oldest was 30. I, I felt empowered that I, I too can right almost every wrong as long as I can pers persevere despite whatever odds may be placed in my way. So I, t I took that with me when I was a grad student at UC Berkeley and trying to figure out how to plug into activism back in the United States and got involved in a UC Go Solar student campaign that was supported by Greenpeace and managed within one year, one academic year, to get the UC Board of Regents to adopt an ambitious green building clean energy policy. I want to share a quote with you from one of the administrators at the UC Office of the President who soon after hired me to try to implement this policy that I was demanding at the university do. 
and they hired me and said, Matt's a lesson and careful what you ask for. He said the university should do this. We said, we hired him and said, all right, try. Um, but we had an exchange when we were getting through the last pockets of resistance to the regents adopting the policy. Um, in response to an email I'd sent over the weekend to one of the administrators, I turned on my computer on Monday morning, had a response back and said, that said, Matt, what you young people have done to engage us oldies in this issue gives me hope that the future is in good hands. What have we accomplished there? The policy, in my six years there, we've expanded it from those first two topics to eight sections, 18 pages long of policy goals and timelines to get there. University of California has a goal of lead certification for all buildings, new and renovated, that will be carbon neutral as soon as possible, that will be zero waste by 2020, that will have 20% sustainable food in all of our campus food services also by 2020. Some of the results, we immediately became the seventh largest purchaser, institutional purchaser of renewable energy in the country when we passed the policy. We have the most largest number of LEED certifications of any university in the country, if you look at us as a whole, which is not really fair, but uh, the regents look at it that way. We uh, opened the first zero waste sports stadium in the country, which has been followed by others, others larger than us. Um, and we're now taking the first steps to use our purchasing power to transform local food systems to be more humane and more sustainable. However, we have a long way to go. The university's environmental impact is still tremendous. And we are not even coming close yet, I believe, to reaching every all, all of the 225,000 students in the University of California system are not yet affected fully, I believe, by our modeling of sustainable technologies and behavior. And then third, we have a long way to go in making the connection between environmental sustainability and social sustainability, mm -hmm. which brings me to what Swarthmore's leadership role could be. I'll start with a couple questions. Why, why is Swarthmore, despite some admirable early actions, not blazing the type of leadership trail and sustainability that Swarthmore always has and still does on social justice issues? I think it's illustrative to ask a parallel question, which is why haven't Quakers, given the Swarthmore has a Quaker heritage, why haven't Quakers been as visible environmental leaders like they always have been and still are on social justice issues? There are many answers, a couple just to mention here, is that I've heard many Quakers say that, oh, environmentalism, that's an elitist cause. Uh, environmentalists traditionally have been viewed to have ca to care more about trees and lizards than people. Um, sustainability, moving from environmental to sustainability, part of the importance of that is to acknowledge that you can't address environmental problems without looking at the economic and social implications, just like you can't have an economy and ignore the environmental and social implications of your economic structure. Within the University of California, we are forced to take out all reference to social responsibility in the environmentally preferable purchasing section of our sustainability policy. And then nationally, I'm a founding member of the Board of Directors of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, and we've developed what we call the Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System to help benchmark, track, and um, comprehensively push higher education forward and sustainability. And what the biggest battle in the three-year, four-year long consensus process to come up with what are the metrics, what are the credits in that system, were people in the sustainability higher ed community saying, why are you asking, why do you have credits on diversity of faculty and diversity of students and living wage for all students? Those, yeah, those are important, but they're not part of sustainability. It's going to muddy the waters. So we're having those battles. I believe that Swarthmore potentially could have a unique contribution to make, even if it's late in the game and being a leader in sustainability, with its wealth of legacy in addressing social justice to help bridge this chasm that still exists between social sustainability and environmental sustainability. And I've already seen a couple of great examples of this. Locally, I know that students have helped start an organic garden in Chester, looking at environmental justice, food security issues. And then beyond the bu utopian bubble of, of the Swarthmore community, uh, Swarthmore students were active in getting a uh, responsible investments committee uh, for the for, you, for Swarthmore's investment practices, and then took that model nationally. And so the biggest 
motivator for students around the country questioning their university's investment practices and the environmental social implications thereof are, is the Responsible Endowments Coalition, which is started by Swarthmore graduates with some core initial funding from some Swarthmore funds. So do current and future Swarthmore students need sustainability literacy to get by? They can certainly do most jobs fine without being sustainable, sustainability literate, but Swarthmore doesn't invest in this community and its students to just get by. Every graduate in every field, if so inspired and led by what they learn inside and outside the classroom and on planet Swarthmore, can and hopefully will be an entrepreneurial leader to identify and seize the opportunity in their office, in their company, in their agency, in their university department, to transform hidden and visible impacts of the places and the communities that they are a part of. In so doing, Swarthmore will have helped inspired both Swarthmore as a community and the individual graduates to be beacons of hope. Thank you. I'd like to remind the audience that if you have any comments or questions, you can hold up your hands and someone will come by and either give you a card or take the card and pass it up here. In the meantime, oh, and I'd, I'd like to say something else, especially for those people who are in the previous panel. I have all the cards from the previous panel, and I'm going to collect all these cards and put them online with responses. So your questions, you'll get feedback if we don't have time for it here. There will be feedback on, the, on our website. So um, now uh, I'd like to ask the panelists, though, for any comments they have about, to each other's comments before. Uh, while we're getting the questions. So. Uh, mine's not so much a response, but more uh, um, a rem I've, something that uh, Matt just said reminded me that I wanted to bring up uh, a wonderful book that uh, was actually written by a Quaker and is part of a, a Quaker um, undertaking called uh, The Moral Economy Project um, of the Quaker Institute for the Future, which I actually don't know that much about, but it sounds like Matt knows about it. The book is called Right Relationship Building a Whole Earth Economy, um, and uh, authored by Peter Brown and Jeffrey Garver. And I just learned about it. Um, this is one of the, in fact, the story is one of the examples of why it's so important to have this interdisciplinary approach to addressing sustainability problems. One of my colleagues at Dartmouth is an ecological economist, uh, Rich Howarth, and he's very good friends with Peter Brown, who's the uh, lead author of this book. Peter Brown is trained as a philosopher, um, is a Quaker, but uh, has been actually quite influential in um, public policy education in the United States. He founded the program and I think the School of Public Policy at University of Maryland and now he's in a public policy program um, at McGill University. So very interesting combination of uh, um, um, philosophy, public policy, and has now written this book in which he makes a very strong argument um, for why we need to be thinking about the commonwealth of life as a whole, human life and all other forms of life, and uh, why we need to really fundamentally transform the way um, we approach our economy. It doesn't mean that we get rid of capitalism, but it might mean that we, we change um, some of our objectives and goals. Uh, the last chapter of the book is quite provocative, I think probably would be quite controversial for some people because it's actually talking about the need for a stronger um, uh, sort of whole earth form of government. Um, but the reason I bring this book up is uh, I'm using it in a course that I'm teaching right now called Environment and Society Towards Sustainability? Question mark. And uh, we've divided the course into three parts. And the third part is about really what can students do and, and, and how can they change their thinking to become leaders um, in a sustainability transition. And so we're going to be reading this book. And uh, I was just really excited when I got turned on to it to see that Quakers were behind this. Um, so maybe you can say a little more. I think I'll, I'll let yeah, start answering the questions. I've got a bunch of fantastic questions oh, here, so there's yeah, just not a chance. Um, this ties together a bunch of things. Can you define social sustainability, which we've discussed about in various contexts today? Can you define social sustainability in a way that doesn't just ignore the real differences in values and philosophy that inform social ideas? That's a Swarthmore question for you. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations to whoever wrote that. I'll take a stab at it. Yeah. Okay. Or do you want to take a stab? Uh, I'll let you go first. <laughs> in other words, <laughs> do you want to take a stab? Are there real? I mean, are there well, real differences in philosophy? Yeah. 
Actually, you know, one of the difficulties about sustainability, uh, and it's why I brought up this idea of epistemic cognition, is I actually don't think it's realistic to think that we are going to all end up with the same mental models and the same epistemologies. I think instead, the reason we need to understand each other's differences, um, it, was, it was articulated very clearly in the last panel too, is so that we can at least find meeting points or overlaps between our different mental models so that we then can come up with solutions that will accommodate different ways of thinking. So I guess when I think of social sustainability, I don't think it means that we are going to get to a point that everyone's exactly going to have the same set of social goals. Um, but I think it's more about figuring out how can we negotiate with each other um, to figure out, okay, what are some of the fundamental things? I don't think really any of us will want, regardless of what our social values are, we want a world where the average temperature of the planet is six degrees higher and there are all these catastrophes that happen to our way of living. Um, but then within that, we need to understand that we will have some fundamental differences in our social values and just figure out how do we at least address these sort of systemic problems so they don't undermine our very ability to even have debates about those social values. Yeah, just a few thoughts. Uh, social sustainability is probably a lot harder to define for the reasons that uh, in the way the question is phrased, but there is a convergence in uh, standards uh, or in factors if you look at reporting initiatives like the Global Reporting Initiative uh, or um, some very basic uh, frameworks, uh, the natural step has mm -hmm. one system condition that has to do with social equity uh, or even cradle to cradle with celebrating diversity, um, employee well-being, you know, the process of reaching out to communities, transparency, these are elements that uh, I think may ha have some promise that I certainly haven't explored, but uh, the potential to cut across different cultures and, and value sets. Matt, any comment? I would just say that you could ask the same hard question about what does environmental sustainability look like? And is there one definition of that? And do we know what it looks like? And do we know how to get there? Uh, so you could say the same thing about both. and the. The important thing is to acknowledge that when you're looking at the environmental problems, you also deal with the social, and when you're looking at the social, you deal with the environmental, and we go through a process of envisioning where are the impacts and how to improve the impacts. A natural step provides one useful framework for defining sustainability and analyzing what a fully sustainable community would look like and how to get there from here. Would you like to each have a, just a word about sustainability? Because that, yeah, we get a lot of questions about what that means in what context. So you want to take, okay. take a shot? I, you know, I think one exciting development in sustainability is it was defined, the best known definition probably many of you know is the one from the 1980s, 1987, the former Prime Minister of Norway, uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That was a very societal definition. But the question was for institutions, organizations of all sorts, and especially business, what were they supposed to do with that? That's a societal, vague, general societal definition. And so now we're getting it much more defined in business, for example. It's really about how to incorporate environmental health and social performance in the life cycle of a product without any trade-offs in price or quality. So what the marketplace expectation is, is that through innovation, companies are able to embed environmental health and social. Now the question is, what is and which environmental health and social, right? Well, here's one key thought to, to have. We now have this global collaborative effort around sustainability. It's almost as if, you know, I, I think of, um, uh, these collaborative platforms on the internet that allow stakeholders from across the world to pitch in to, you know, define and hold companies accountable to what is environmental and health and so ex socially acceptable. So it's like th th there is the technological um, foundation now to get a real collective effort, collaborative collective effort to converge on what is acceptable and what isn't. That's not a perfect answer but at least we're away from it's this person's opinion or that person's opinion. Yeah, you want to take it, Anne? Well, the only thing I'll add will actually probably just make 
the discussion about this more complex, and that is that there's actually really huge scholarship on um, different definitions of sustainability, and sort of the message that comes from all that scholarship is that there are a plurality of approaches, and that's actually probably healthy to have this plurality of approaches. So I think sort of building on what Chris just said, we, we shouldn't try to close down that plurality of approaches or plurality of, of definitions, but we can take advantage of these, for example, communication technologies that make it easier for us to work things out with each other, which is why I was emphasizing that in the curricula, a big part of the training has to be forming, leading, and facilitating teams of people who come from very different starting places so that you can negotiate answers of what will sustain it, how will we define sustainability at Swarthmore College? How will it, how will that, how will we then implement that definition to change the things that we do here um, and the ways that we impact our surrounding environment and our surrounding uh, communities? Uh, the only other thing I would add is there's a very interesting definition that I read a few years ago written by an industrial ecologist and, uh, named John Ehrenfeld, and he simply defines sustainability as the possibility that all that human and all other life on Earth will flourish forever. Now, a friend of mine who um, tends to be interested in things like Buddhism and, and Hinduism and Taoism pointed out to me that forever is maybe um, shows a certain amount of hubris on our part. So I guess I, I would be okay with it has to do with the possibility that human and all other life on Earth will flourish for a long time. But I think what's important about that definition is the word flourish. And I've reflected on that a lot and sometimes say to myself, you know, I actually think sustainability boils down to what does it mean to have a meaningful life? And how do I make sure that I leave that opportunity for future generations for them to be able to decide what it means to have a meaningful life? And maybe meaning isn't so much about having so much stuff. I think we're all beginning to recognize that. And the having all that stuff is directly related to things like our greenhouse gas emissions and our water pollution and our air pollution, et cetera. Maybe it is really more about being and about the quality of our relationships with each other. Now notice that a lot of what I just said there is directly tied to Swarthmore's core values. Um, I'd like to add from my perspective that even when you look at very narrow things, like we were having a discussion of the plastic cups up here earlier and whether they should be the compostable corn uh, plastic, and then we discussed the fact that that corn is probably not grown sustainably, oh, certainly not, and the fact is there isn't always an answer. There isn't always the right way. Oftentimes there's, well, this is bad in these ways and good in these other ways and this other one the other way, and we, we as a society have to find our way forward and develop new solutions. And so the, the fact that there isn't one definition of sustainability, there's also not one right answer for any given problem that we might face. But we have to weigh those critically, find out the strengths and weaknesses, and, and take action. We've been talking about taking action. And that leads me to another question which is, from, from the audience, which is about actions. Um, and I have sort of two categories. One is um, what we've, we've been doing this, we've talked about action outside the uh, academy, but we've had several questions about um, immediate town, gown, or regional, what should Swarthmore do in the region, in, 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 in the area, are there actions we should take, are there recommendations that the panel has for things that the college should consider doing that we're not doing? And then, um, and then sort of on the flip side of this, and this is mostly for Matt, since you were so effective at getting the University of California to pay attention to these things, what actions should students take here to um, bring about systemic change in the institution? So there's two, two levels of action. Any, any comments about sort of action, action items? Oh, it's a long list. <laughs> um, actions locally, regionally. I think it's important for Swarthmore to develop, as has been said, its own unique role and niche and where it can contribute and build upon what it's already strong and has a good legacy in. I, I think it's important that everything that the college does it uses as an educational opportunity, which it's doing a great job of with its buildings, with each um, wonderfully idealistic, to some administrators, cockamamie idea that students bring forth that they should do next on the campus. Um, it's an educational opportunity for all involved, actually, both sides. I think it's great that, that, and I want to congratulate President Chop on signing the American College and University President's climate commitment. I think it's important that 
as part of that, that leadership and being visible and being part of a, a movement and not acting in isolation, but helping to bring along the local and regional and national communities that Swarthmore is a part of in that direction. Um, so in, in tangible actions, definitely thinking about how sustainability can be manifested as a core value for the college, what would that look like? Does that, is there a mission statement, a vision statement that would be useful for the college to have and for people to use as a reference point? Um, in, the, in, its, in its master planning, both academic or physical, for the campus, what role does sustainability have to play? The next capital campaign, very important. Um, what role does, does sustainability have to play both on the curricular side, so tangible action to think about. Well, so what, what could Swarthmore do to make sure that all of its students have a grasp of sustainability literacy um, and dealing with complexity and interconnected um, problems? And then on the, the, on the modeling sustainability on, on the planet Swarthmore side, what can it do? Does, does, is there a place at Swarthmore for a sustainability director, a sustainability office, as some of the other colleges and universities have taken a leadership, who have taken a leadership in position in sustainability have done? Um, and how would the, the Carth, how would the college in difficult economic times um, support such a position like that? What role would alumni play in having to support that or an endowment to support that? Um, in terms of how students can approach this, um, I work hard with the, the students that I interact with on the, on the UC campuses to get them to both collaborate with the administration and push them very hard at the same time, and it's important to do one with the other and not one without the other. Um, and I think that the students here are already doing a good job of that. I encourage them to feel like they, they are the, to use another quote that I picked up when I, was a, when I was a student working on this campaign, there was a renewable energy trade newsletter in which uh, Vice President of Dickinson College uh, was commenting on why the college had made a, a large wind energy purchase. And he said, um, you know, the, the students are our conscience. Too often for the college, it's always the bottom line. But the students are our conscience, and we know that they're right. We need to listen to them more and more. You can imagine how uh, thrilled I was as a student to have that quote to throw back at the administrators. But now, as an administrator myself, I use that because I also can get bogged down in the bottom line and what is possible um, in the day-to-day -day and lose track of what should be, not just what can be. And so I encourage the, the students to tackle everything, no matter how impossible it might seem. And I think that this generation has a, a key role to play. I think the Einstein quote, I was going to use the same thing, mm -hmm. same thinking that got us here isn't going to get us out of it. So one example, I, and this is my, my last comment on this note, um, when we decided to send a man to the moon in 10 years, everyone thought that was impossible. Just like we now think it's politically, or maybe some people say economically, impossible to stop global climate disruption. We did it in nine. And when the, the first person took, took the first step on the moon and cheers went up in command control in Houston, the average age in that control room was 26. It's going to be the young generation that's going to make this change. Do you guys want it? Do you want me to? Nope. Any more comments? I'll just add one point um, that it's probably best uh, made by just giving an example. I think that part of the answer is, is to combine actually town gown interactions and student involvement. So I'll give you an example that's just unfolding now um, in the Hanover area where Dartmouth College is. There's this really exciting new company called Carbon Harvest Energy that has approached me and other people at the college, they are um, proposing to the nearby town of Lebanon to um, harvest the methane from their landfill, convert it, burn it in a combined heat and power system, so that's going to generate some power, which they would like to sell all to Dartmouth College. Um, in converting it, because they convert the methane to carbon dioxide, which is four times less uh, potent greenhouse gas, they're actually going to be able to sell some carbon credits. And then they're going to take the carbon dioxide and bubble it through tanks of water where they're going to raise algae, and they're doing really interesting research on biofuels, but also algae for human feed, um, human nutritional values, and raise fish. 
So they're going to end up doing combined agriculture system, energy production, and dealing with one big problem, which is the methane from our landfills. And so they want to collaborate with us. They want to have ways that students can be doing projects. I'm actually thinking seriously that they might become our first partner for the Sustainability Action Research course. That's going to be a key course in our, in our new sustainability track. Um, we're even talking about maybe establishing a research laboratory there. And this is really, I think, the kind of thing that Swarthmore should be looking at, too. Um, it might be that the way we all get to being able to meet the President's climate commitment is not by institutions doing it alone, but working in a very strategic way um, with their partners, maybe not only in the town of Swarthmore, but in this general area. I don't know enough about your energy issues in this area, but I bet you have landfills around here also, and we're actually, you know, we've been pretty foolish, actually, about how to deal with our landfills for many years. A very famous uh, ecologist, Howard Odom, figured out years ago that if we just mined the landfills, we would actually have a tremendous amount of valuable resources that we could be um, recycling. So this is a really exciting example of that, a money-making example. I keep thinking the guy who started this business is going to get really rich. Uh, which brings us to our last question. Uh, sorry. And all the other questions that were asked will go on the website. Um, how can Swarthmore graduates be leaders in sustainability without being literate about business and the importance of the economic viability of sustainable practices? Chris? <laughs> Is the answer that they really can't be leaders unless they, unless we provide some uh, some help in advancing their understanding, or do you have, yeah. Well, <clears throat> and, and in particular, I think the focus here of the question is on the economic viability of sustainable sustainable practices. Right. The economic viability is absolutely critical if we want to make a mainstream change in time to make a difference then we can't be working along the fringes. We can't be working with two or three percent of the population that is willing to you know, do the volunteering and, uh, and you know, spend more money for special products and so on. So it has to be uh, in mainstream business. And um, to do that, or at, le at least I want to say mainstream business has to be part of the equation. To do that, I'm not suggesting that Swarthmore would need to have business courses. That doesn't seem to me that to be the case. I, what I'm suggesting is that you get, if if we could get uh, interdisciplinary scholarship at Swarthmore, and and that Swarthmore graduates go with a broad uh, knowledge base, an interdisciplinary knowledge base, and an interest to go then into business schools. Uh, because they can see that business it could be an agent of world benefit, not because we're adding a new profit, uh, a new purpose to business, you know, to save the whales. To, this is uh, the purpose of business is to make money for its shareholders, but because the marketplace has changed, the way you make money for your shareholders now is you have to integrate these environmental, health, and social dimensions. So if students can see that, you know, if I, I would say that. Yes, it would be good to have an economics grounding uh, here, uh, but you don't need a business grounding at the undergraduate level. I mean, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn because I haven't actually thought this out well enough. My sense is that uh, it's everything except the pure business stuff that you want to cover as a solid foundation here, and then you can get the business training um, in graduate school. Well, the only thing I would add to that is really coming back to the point I keep stressing about teams, what you want is that the the graduates from Swarthmore, even if they're an art major or um, a biology major, know enough about economics that they can really talk to an economist and a business major and also know when it's really key to bring them into the process um, in addressing sustainability problems, so that they can really function well in those interdisciplinary teams. Interdisciplinary teams doesn't mean that everybody sitting at the table has equal mastery of the fields. It's actually the opposite. It's that they have different masteries but they have just enough overlap, think of that Venn diagram thing, enough overlap of, of at least understanding a little bit of each other's key concepts um, and terminology that they can communicate and that they especially know when it's time to bring in someone with knowledge from a certain area to address to solve the problem so that you're aware of the, the blinders of your particular knowledge and know then when to turn to others. Matt, uh, I'd like you to have the last word and you have one minute. Mm -hmm. Four point. Uh, well, I'll admit to have had a, 
to having had an anti-business bias that I thankfully have been freed from in my current job where <laughs> I see the vital role that businesses are playing and that there's not, it's not that all businesses are bad, that there are some businesses are bad and there's some businesses that are doing great work and we need to support them in every way possible because they're developing the products and services that will provide the solutions to the problems that we're trying to address. So I'll just leave it with there. Thank you. <laughs> Let's thank the panel. Yeah.